Welcome, everyone. Do I have Sten online now? You do. Thank you for letting me in. Yes, of course. Thank you for joining us. Well, it is 9.15 on the dot, and our guest of honor is here. That's you, Sten. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so please take it away, and welcome to the Rita Wilson Prize. Thank you. So um, thanks for joining us. Uh, this is the inaugural Rita Wilson Prize. And this uh, Rita Wilson Prize Fund uh, is, as you know, in support of innovation and entrepreneurship, a $10,000 uh, cash prize that we will be awarding to the best student-led venture uh, that is focused on creating a technological solution to address a health disparity in the United States. And uh, there were 15 applicants, and shortly you're going to hear from the four finalists. And uh, more now than ever, we need uh, innovation in health tech. Just take a look at the um, coronavirus uh, response. Uh, we weren't ready with mass production of um, gowns, with proper mass production of uh, masks. Uh, it took a long uh, time to figure out how to sterilize those masks. Uh, uh, we didn't have um, ventilators available. Um, we didn't have test kits. Uh, we didn't have um, uh, drugs or vaccines. And you might say, well, Stan, why do you say this? Because this is all a brand new virus. Well, guess what? It's not a brand new virus. Um, yeah, this particular strain is, but coronaviruses are um, uh, well known in, in pediatrics for, for decades. Um, they cause uh, cold-like symptoms in kids. And we had uh, SARS in 2003, 2004, where we needed the N95s, we needed the gowns, we needed the, uh, the ventilators, we needed everything that we need now. And then we had a reminder uh, in uh, 2009 with the pandemic, flu that we've all also had in 2000, in 1968 and 1957 and 1918, 1919. And we had MERS. I mean, uh, we have all these warnings. So innovation in health tech has to look at the past, has to anticipate the future, and has to uh, embrace um, issues that are ahead of the curve, issues that anticipate future needs as well as meeting current ones. So on that little note, I wanted to thank all of our participants, our judges, our partners, our donors for making uh, this um, uh, competition possible. And we're really excited to see and hear from these teams. So turning it back to you, uh, Fatima. Thank you so much, Sven. And I see some of our panelists are still joining us. So just uh, a few Quick notes, make sure you're muted if you're not speaking. And if you need tech support at any time, if you're a panelist or a judge, please privately message Abigail Winslow and she will be sure to help you out. So we're gonna start with a very short presentation. And I am pulling it up. Is Abigail related to our school's founder, Professor Winslow? I don't know, Abby, are you? No, sadly I'm not. You never know, you might be a distant cousin. <laughs> no. So again, thank you all so much for joining us and being a part of Startup Yale 2020, our very first ever virtual Startup Yale. I wanted to welcome all of our judges today. Uh, they've all taken time out of their very, very busy schedules, and I really appreciate all of their time. We have Nicole Allen from Yale Institute for Global Health, Kave Kushnud, who's also the faculty director for Innovate Health Yale, Susan Nappy from the Office of Public Health Practice, and Professor Jody Sindler, a professor of public health, health policy, and professor of economics. Thank you all so much again. And then a big shout out to our teams. I've had the pleasure of coaching these teams, some of them for several months and some of them for several weeks. And I've actually known some of them 
for over a year now. So that's, it's very exciting to see their growth and I'm really excited to hear from them today. Our schedule is as follows. We will get started with Enlighten, who will do a 10 minute presentation. And then we'll have 10 minutes for judges questions. Uzma, who is our amazing Innovate Health Yale fellow, will be calling out time at 10 minutes. So please make sure that you have your timers on as well, teams, and, and you're ready to wrap it up by then. Then we'll get to Team Fresh Air, then Team COVID-DX, and then Team WISP. Afterwards, the judges and I will go into a private room to deliberate, and then by 11.25 or earlier, we'll be back into this main room to share with you who the grand prize winner is. And of course, thank you to all of the sponsors who make this possible and all of our Innovate Health Yale donors as well who made this possible. And with that, and with that, we can get started with our first team. So team, whenever you're ready, please take the floor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lena Goldstein. I'm a sophomore at Yale College studying anthropology, and I'm one sixth of the Enlighten team. Enlighten is a medical device startup, and our goal is to prevent solitary setting opioid overdose deaths. We produce a wearable device that detects and reverses opioid overdoses. So in 2017, the United States government declared the national opioid crisis a public health emergency. Opioids are a class of drugs that provide pain relief, and they work by binding to specific receptors in the body. The first problem is that they're highly addictive and can result in overdose. The second problem is that in recent years, deadlier, stronger opioids like fentanyl can cause an overdose in a matter of seconds, not minutes. So in the United States alone, more than 46,000 people died from opioid drug-related death in 2018. The opioid crisis is familiar in a more personal way to many of us. People suffering from addiction become isolated from their family and their friends. And often when an overdose event occurs, there's nobody around to witness it and call for help. The only way to prevent overdose death is with a drug that temporarily reverses overdose. It's called naloxone, but we know it more commonly as Narcan. So naloxone can be administered by anyone, a stranger, a friend, a police officer, or a doctor, but people with addiction continue to overdose privately or around other opioid users where there's nobody around to help. We'll solve this problem of overdosing alone by designing something we call a naloxone sensory injector. This is a device called Enlighten. The device will inject naloxone when it senses an overdose, eliminating the need for a third party to administer the life-saving drug. Hello, I'm Josh and I'm an engineer on the Enlighten team. So we're a team of five undergrads from Yale College that formed through the Yale Helix Incubator. Our team is perfect for Enlighten because we bring a fresh set of eyes from different fields to a project that we've been committed to for almost a year now. We're supported by our faculty advisor, Dr. Min Hee Sung, who is an addiction medicine research fellow at the Yale Veterans Hospital with an engineering undergraduate degree from MIT. Her firsthand experience caring for patients with opioid addiction is key to helping us contextualize this venture and the need within the larger opioid crisis. So how would Enlighten work? So first you'd need a biomarker. Pulse oximetry, which many of you may recognize as the fingertip monitor that you wear while staying in a hospital, tracks the level of oxygen in your blood. So when blood oxygen level gets too low, there isn't enough oxygen in your organs to maintain function. And this is a telltale sign of overdose. Second, you'd need a wristband to detect and interpret the vital signs coming from your fingertip. This wristband would contain a mechanism capable of injecting the drug naloxone. 
This temporarily reverses the overdose, allowing the person to wake up and then pursue emergency medical attention and follow-up care. So what would Enlighten look like? As you can see, we've drawn a schematic below. The device is a wearable, like a wristband and a finger ring, discreet so no one around would suspect its function, and refillable to guarantee long-lasting protection against overdose death. So are people going to use it? Will people with addiction want a device like Enlighten? Yes. A recent study from Vancouver, Canada asked 1,000 people with addiction whether they'd be willing to wear a device that detects overdose and alerts others nearby of the event. 55% of the participants said yes. Those who had overdosed previously and those who were enrolled in treatment centers were even more likely to say yes. But what about in New Haven? Well, we'd like to find out. So we have an IRB pending qualitative study which will take place at the Yale Addiction Clinics and will evaluate willingness to wear a device which has both the capacity to detect and to reverse an overdose. Right, so now I'd like to walk you through some of the photos of the prototype that we built. So first, Enlighten uses a finger-mounted pulse oximeter that monitors vitals. Second, the pulse ox will be connected via Bluetooth to a wristband that also has a digital screen monitor. The computer processor also lives on the wristband and has an algorithm for detecting an overdose, which triggers a motor to inject an naloxone in the wrist subcutaneously. The device is loaded with five doses and is capable of multiple injections, as this is often necessary to reverse a single overdose event. So far, we've been able to simulate overdose detection in a virtual environment, and that has allowed us to test all the, test all the functions of our prototype components. Our final algorithm will require FDA approval and also rely on data from clinical trials. So how many people are gonna benefit from Enlighten? To date, 2.1 million Americans have been formally diagnosed with opioid use disorder, with a total of 11 million having a history of opioid misuse and abuse. And the naloxone market keeps growing. Between 2013 and 2017, unit sales of naloxone have doubled. And by 2026, the dollar market size for naloxone will be $928 million. Hi, I'm Saul and I'm gonna be talking about the business model for Enlighten. Enlighten will offer two products. The initial products will include the device itself with wristband and pulse oximeter, along with the first vial of five doses of naloxone. The subsequent purchases will simply replace the naloxone vial. We will pursue intellectual property for the specific size and shape of our vial so it fits specifically into our device. This business model is a razor razor blade or Gillette razor blade model in which we sell the initial device at cost and generate our profits through the sale of a replaceable component. This model is beneficial because it ensures a longer lifespan for our device. We priced our products conservatively. Currently, over-the-counter versions of naloxone injectables are sold at $90 a dose. Our vial will contain five doses and will be priced at $250. The gross profit for the two products is the same at $185. The initial device is sold at cost and the majority of our profits will come from the refill purchases. To be clear, this pricing scheme is not representative of what a person will actually pay. Insurance coverage will make Enlighten affordable. This is essential because many of the potential customers of Enlighten are of socio lower socioeconomic status. In fact, four out of every 10 patients in the US with OUD is covered by Medicaid. Fortunately, naloxone products are covered by most major health insurance programs. Enlighten will be too. Here we have a conservative five-year growth model for Enlighten. We used assumptions about the shelf life of naloxone and about the rate of overdoses per year. Even with these conservative estimates, this growth model shows a sustainable venture that continues to be profitable and save the lives of many of our customers each year. So how will interested people get enlightened? So our go-to-market strategy is to distribute the devices as quickly and as cheaply as possible through nonprofits and educational programs. But of course, our long-term channels of distribution will be more diverse. Most importantly, naloxone products are increasingly available without a physician's prescription. Enlighten will be too. Certain people are at higher risk of overdose death, including post-incarceration patients and people who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. Enlighten will also be important for patients enrolled in methadone treatment clinics and rehabilitation centers, because the science shows that if you've experienced overdose, you're at higher risk of suffering overdose again. This is how we're different. So some companies like Hope Band and Oxalert make wristbands that detect overdose. 
Other companies make and distribute naloxone, the drug itself, in different forms, such as nasal sprays or injectables. These drugs reverse overdose. Only Enlighten detects and reverses overdose, and we do it for cheaper. So in the last eight months, we've ideated and built our prototype. Our next steps will integrate the finalized prototype, secure IP, complete the study at the Yale Addiction Centers, file a 510K with the FDA for our class two medical device and initiate clinical trials, as well as go to market. We're very lucky to have received $4,000 in seed funding from the Rita Wilson Seed Prize, the Rothberg Catalyzer Prototype Fund, and the Yale Helix Incubator. We work in the Center for Engineering and Innovation Design, but we benefit from wisdom outside of the Yale College, including through Health Haven Hub, the Yale Veterans Hospital, and the Yale Medical School. Our team would greatly benefit from $10,000. With the money from the Wilson Prize, we'll finalize our prototype and begin the regulatory process for investigational device exemption which, and produce 20 enlightened prototype devices for early clinical trials. Thank you for considering us for the Rita Wilson Prize. We fit the bill. We're student led and we're student run. We're solving a problem that disproportionately affects populations who come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And we're doing it with new technology. We're trying to save lives at a moment of particular vulnerability. This is a technology that's sorely needed for a problem that has not yet been solved. We'd like to take questions now. Thank you so much, Team Enlighten. Judges, please feel free to unmute and jump in. Um, this is Kavit. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the Vancouver study because my initial concern was, um, would drug users be willing to do this? And I'm glad to see that a study was published in Vancouver, but I think the environment in, in Canada is quite different. Um, you may have heard about needle exchange programs, which is a very different program to reduce HIV transmission, but some of the concern of the users was if they're carrying syringes with them, it's an indication that they're a drug user. So they become a risk for arrest. Uh, I noticed in your application that you did have a conversation with the police department. And I'm sort of curious what the police had to say about this. And have you thought about um, drug users not being willing to wear something like this if it's going to indicate I'm a drug user? Absolutely. I can take this one. Uh, so the first kind of concern that we had with the Vancouver study is that this is a, a, evaluating willingness to wear a device that simply detects overdose. Of course, our device Enlighten will take it a step further in that it both combines the ability to detect and reverse overdose. So that's why we're pursuing this IRB pending qualitative study at the Yale Addiction Clinics so that we can speak more directly with customers. We do have an advantage in that our faculty advisor is an addiction medicine research expert who gets to treat patients with addiction every day. Um, and so we have heard many, many stories firsthand, but certainly this IRB study will help us to kind of confirm um, what we suspect to be true. And then in terms of carrying a syringe um, and, and arrest concerns, the naloxone vial, the vial that snaps into our device can be thought of more in like a Keurig K-cup model, for example, where the Keurig coffee pods fit into the machine itself and that's it. So the actual vial of naloxone will not be attached um, directly to a syringe. So it'll be a vial with five doses in it that snaps into the device that then employs the, the injectable mechanism. Could you say something about the conversation you had with the police department? Which Absolutely. Was yeah. Absolutely. So we had a chance to speak to several of the Yale police officers who talk about um, their time and their carrying of the naloxone nasal spray products. And one major concern that they had um, with, the, with their current situation is that they carry the naloxone nasal sprays and the EpiPen type models, uh, but they are afraid to use and administer the naloxone unless the patient is fully unconscious. And we know that hypoxia is a later symptom of overdose. So the hypoxia follows the initial respiratory depression. And now overdoses can happen 
happen in a matter of seconds. So if they are able to access patients who need naloxone who are overdosing, um, they're not willing to administer the naloxone until the patient is certainly unconscious, which we feel is too late. And it also doesn't solve the problem of solitary setting opioid use, uh, which directly is the problem that we're trying to solve. So those were some of the concerns that they have with their current routine and some of the interest that they had in our device. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for that presentation. It was, it definitely answered a lot of questions I had when reviewing the application. I think one of the things that I was um, curious about and you probably thought about and I'd like to hear more about is the treatment follow-up plan. Because I think while, um, you know, if you iron out all those details around durability, wearability, whether it's culturally responsive, there's still the issue of follow-up once you're utilizing it. So I'm wondering what your team has, has sort of thought about with respect to treatment follow-up? Sure, I can take that question. I'm, um, I'm Minhi, I'm the um, faculty advisor on the team. Um, so I think ultimately our hope and our mission for our device is that it can prevent overdose death so that it gives patients the opportunities to seek the treatment and care that they, they desperately need. And um, unlike any other disease, um, opioid addiction requires um, multiple, multiple attempts, just like with weight loss, multiple attempts, multiple appointments with treatment providers. So our hope is that um, we want to keep these people alive. We don't want them to die from overdose. And then after they seek emergency care or medical care, um, we would like for them to see, we would encourage them uh, to see treatment providers of buprenorphine, providers who can prescribe methadone, um, plug into psychi uh, psychiatry care. Um, something uh, later stage that we're even thinking about is building sort of a, a support network and uh, a list of resources for these uh, patients to seek out. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I just want to second that you, you uh, address a lot of my questions from your application and your presentation. So thank you very much for that. One of my questions is might be really basic, um, but does this have the potential to increase um, a patient's exposure to naloxone over time? And what are the potential health risks and how could those be mitigated with a repeat, uh, potentially repeat overdoses and repeat treatment through uh, with naloxone through the device? Sure, so I can answer that question as well. So naloxone is a very safe medicine. That's the reason why um, more recently uh, uh, for a lot of pharmacies, naloxone is actually av available over the counter, just like your regular Tylenol. Uh, you don't need a prescription for it anymore. Um, and um, I think that is very telling about how, how safe our FDA believes that this medicine is. Um, we will be including five doses of the naloxone in our device because um, um, very commonly when someone overdoses, um, sometimes it requires multiple doses of naloxone in order for a person to wake up. Um, so we want to include that as a safety feature um, of our device so that we can ensure that someone can um, recover from an overdose. Um, and then the reason why um, some side effects of naloxone the only side effect is that if you have any opioids in your system at all, because you've taken heroin or, or are on Percocets, then it can cause withdrawal, uh, which can be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but I think when you're thinking about, you know, death from overdose versus the uncomfortable side effects of um, withdrawal, uh, clearly it's, it's um, a lot, it's far more important to, you know, save a life, try to prevent an overdose death. Great, thank you so much for that explanation. You also mentioned that there's a Bluetooth capability in the device. Is that to connect, only to connect the, the um, pulse oximeter to the wristband, or does it have another reporting feature um, to, to track usage over time? Yeah, so that'll be for now just to directly communicate between the pulse ox and the wristband, as you said, so that we can provide data back and forth to run our algorithm. Though there's obviously certain additions that we could add with these Bluetooth technology, potentially like, being able to store this information on the app to be able to send to doctors or something. And that's something that we've certainly talked about, but for now the main Bluetooth capability is just communicating like internally between the system. Great, and sorry, one last question and then I'll, I'll um, let another judge. And that is, um, what is the risk for sharing devices? Um, if, if 
one device is shared among multiple people. Is there um, any risk associated with that? So, um, yes, there could be risk because our currently our, our prototype is uh, what we imagine is for there to be a small subcutaneous needle that that would inject a naloxone. So certainly if you were to um, share that needle amongst um, other folks, then you can increase the risk of bloodborne infect infections. Um, I think, unfortunately, you know, this is already happening and this is why there are needle exchanges so that people can use um, use clean, uh, use like clean and brand new needles every single time instead of sharing needles or licking needles, which, which definitely happens. Um, but, you know, our intention is for this to only be used by one person, not to be shared. Um, but that, that is a very excellent point that we should think about. Great, thank you so much. Judges, we have time for one more question for Team Enlighten. So anyone wanna hop in? Jody, do you have anything? Maybe I ask one more question if it's okay. Um, so, you know, there's... Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, Jody, go ahead. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I wasn't on mute, but something happened. I would like to ask about the, both the question is a compound question about your competition, which talks about your sustainability and distribution. So I'm worried thinking about more the business angle of this. Uh, I thought your presentation was great. And I've been interested in this product, you know, for a long time, seeing other teams working on this. So, and I know you know about this because you wrote about it in your uh, application, but could you just give me a little bit more of an analysis of what if other products are developed at the same time? How will you compete? What are gonna be your distribution routes so that it's good to know that you have this great topic, great problem, great solution, but how is it going, is it actually gonna scale up and get to the market in a sustainable, not necessarily profitable, but at least staying in business approach? Right, so I'm happy to jump in here to talk about our competition and then maybe someone else can follow up about the distribution channels that we'd like to pursue. But we kind of like to think about our competition in two separate boats. The first being the middle two columns that you see right here, which are the products on the market, Evzio and the Narcan nasal spray, which allow bystanders to help intervene with naloxone, but don't eliminate the need for a third party. And then the second, as we mentioned in our application, is this main research group from Purdue, which is able to eliminate a third party and dispense naloxone, but their device is super in, has a super invasive technology that literally forces you to always have a naloxone capsule like inside your arm at all times so that it can release upon an overdose. And so the way we're looking at our competition is, yes, there may be other devices that are currently being made, but we really think that our product is the perfect combination between detecting an overdose, reversing it, and also being non-invasive. And as we look to get FDA approval, that'll be easier to protect our IP. And maybe someone else wants to talk about the distributional channels, but that's kind of how we look at competition. Thank you. I can jump in here and talk about intellectual property and the avenues we've kind of thought of so far. And so the first idea is to actually get a patent for the size and shape of our pre-filled naloxone vials. Again, that they would only fit specifically into our device. And then secondary, um, the second component of IP would be copyright for the overdose detection and response algorithm. So the microprocessor that lives in the wristbands uh, that's adjusted not only individually to patients based on their baseline SPO2 values, but that also takes into account all of the current literature that's being published. Um, we're planning through early clinical trials to develop a machine learning model to make sure that this model is specific enough to patients and also specific enough to only detect an overdose when it's truly occurring. And then finally, in terms of channels of distribution, I can quickly go to this slide, but most commercially available forms of naloxone are covered by insurance, particularly CMS, so Medicaid and Medicare. And as Saul mentioned, this is a really important channel for distribution uh, because four out of every 10 patients in the United States that's diagnosed with opioid use disorder is covered by Medicaid. Um, further, in 49 out of 50 states, you can purchase naloxone without a physician's prescription. And so certain pharmacies like CVS and Walgreens have been instrumental in making this possible by training their pharmacists to prescribe naloxone. And then we imagine that 
the first kind of channel to distribution would be to, to distribute the devices as cheaply and as widely as possible. We'd like to get them out there, which is why our business model is to sell them at cost and then to generate profit from the refills. And so the way we get them out there to begin with is through nonprofits, through education programs, to rehabilitation centers, to methadone clinics, um, where there are patients who have already made who have already made strides and steps towards recovering from addiction. Um, so we feel that this is an important part of the initial channels for distribution and eventually this device will be um, expanded in all of its capacities to the, the list that you see on the screen. Okay, thank you. One point, this is just uh, because I'm an economist, you know, the IP on the device, in some sense, since you make all your money off the, uh, the Lexone, maybe you'd be better off having that device really widely spread by anybody because you're selling something that depends on that. So that's a small point, but that is very good responses and very interesting project. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Team Enlighten. Uh, amazing work. If you will go ahead and stop, oh, you already did it, or I could even finish my sentence. Awesome. Okay, next up is Team Fresh Air. So please go ahead and share and then let us know when you start. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Lin. I'm an MPH student from the Environmental Health Sciences Department in the School of Public Health. I'm thrilled to be here with the rest of the Fresh Air team and speak about the wristband we developed to make you more aware of what's in your air you are breathing. Have you ever looked at the ingredients label of your bottle of shampoo or a cleaning product in your house and had some trouble reading through the names of the chemicals? And then thought, are those chemicals safe for me? We had the same thought. There are chemicals in these products that have been found to be unsafe to put on your skin or inhale. Yes, that's right, inhale. Of the frequencies you smell and many other compounds verbalize into the air. Now you are breathing them in. In addition to all the chemicals found in consumer products, there are a cocktail of other chemicals in the air inside of your house. Those chemicals are unique for each of us. And I highlight here the indoor environment because we spend over 90% of the day indoors perhaps even more time with the current COVID-19 pandemic. There are flame retardants that coat on your furniture and carpets, pesticides on your fruits and vegetables, and many others from every room in the house. Just like the bottle of shampoo I mentioned earlier, many of these chemicals fertilize into the air. Exposure to many of these chemicals through inhalation has been linked to adverse health. The exposure is often amplified in lower income communities and contributes to increased health disparities. So if you are now concerned about what you are breathing in, you may be asking, what can I do? There are a handful of lower cost air pollutant monitors available, but they are designed to be placed at a fixed location and typically only measure one airborne contaminant. While these are inexpensive, you are exposed to much more than one chemical and we certainly do not stay at one location all day. There are research grade tools that a person can carry around with them. They are often about the size of five iPhones stacked up. These monitors are portable, but again, typically only measure one airborne contaminant and they are expensive. Would you pay 15,000 to measure where you are breathing? To address this void of products available to measure your exposure to cocktail chemicals you are breathing, we developed the fresh air wristband. It can be used to measure thousands of chemicals simultaneously. It is light, it can be worn while you are working, exercising, and all your routine daily activities. And it is affordable. So we can measure thousands of chemicals, but how can we help users be proactive with this information? Through our highly automated data matching and categorization software, we can analyze the thousands of compounds from a single wristband, process and filter that data, and produce visuals that are both easy for the user to interpret and act on. 
including sources of chemicals as well as toxicity levels. Our team includes experts who have designed a workflow from start to finish, which provides customers with a comprehensive report on personal exposure information, as just discussed by Alex. Animal Aurora is in charge of the business and marketing portion of Fresh Air, whereas Elizabeth Lynn, she has already engineered the passive samplers, deployed them in numerous applications, which I'll talk about, and uh, is an ex expert in the advanced measurement technologies employed. She will continue to advance these technologies to lower costs and decrease turnaround time. Alex Chen and I are in charge of developing the software for data handling and automated report generation, whereas Crystal Pollitt is the faculty mentor and will continue to aid in developing scientific concepts, concepts and academic partnership. We have deployed air samplers globally with over 600 samplers deployed to date. These deployments have allowed us to validate our technologies, develop a number of academic and nonprofit partnerships, and learn how to create trusting relationships with clients spanning a number of countries. By using our workflow, we have determined a number of exposures of concern. For example, in China and South Africa, highly toxic insecticides sprayed for malaria control were found in personal samplers, meaning the people were breathing them in. The compounds are banned in a number of countries and were likely being inhaled. More locally in New Haven, we have found a fungicide, fludioxinol, in a number of participants, a compound which has an array of toxic effects and has recently been researched to be a major concern. Therefore, we have shown that these samplers can be used for discovery of harmful exposures. We have worked and built trust with the local community partners for four years. The low-income communities and their healthcare providers want information from the wristband. Now we want to go back to the community to build our business model together with the local stakeholders. We are envisioning our business similar to 23andMe. By delivering and collecting the sample via mail, we can measure your personalized exposure. We cannot change our genes, but we have the control to change our exposure. So we are likely to have higher repeat customer rates. Now, just to expand on what's already been said from a business perspective, we can combine it in the form of a SWOT analysis. Well, first, our strengths. Well, one major strength is that we're entering the market with a high degree of vertical integration. Almost all the stages of our service have been formed by us in-house. We fabricate the wristband ourselves and we do the analysis ourselves. And that analysis requires some very expensive equipment. The robotic mass spectrometry instrument we're using costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and requires years of expertise to use it properly but we have the instrument in-house and we have the experience. We're also trying to look at what we can patent from our workflow. Saying that, we have identified a couple of potential weaknesses. In the short term, we're looking for financial capital to get us up and moving, and that's why we're here today. In the long term, we think that scaling might be difficult. Firstly, because we're thinking of opening up sales to individuals, as well as B2B and academic collaborators we're looking to now. And secondly, because we don't have experience with late stage companies, so we're actively looking for advice and guidance on that front. Now we're entering the market at a great time to make use of current opportunities. There aren't many competitors in the space at the moment, and there's a rapidly growing interest in pollutants and environmental sciences more generally, especially in the low income communities we're working with. However, we are mindful that there's always a risk of emerging competitors. We think we're relatively safe because of the high barriers to entry I mentioned, but we're keeping a close eye on the field and we're also looking at potential political and regulatory obstacles that might get in the way. Now, in terms of our competitors, there are only a handful of competitors out there which measure exposures at all. Now, I won't go into too much detail about these, but just for a very quick overview, Airbeam and Purple Air, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier, provide stationary measurements of atmospheric pollutants, but they're not personal exposures. Million Marker provides information about a couple of compounds through urine samples. And My Exposome is probably our closest competitor, but they have a much higher price point than we do. And their workflow, along with the different technology they're using, doesn't really allow for as much scalability as we would like. There's also the high-grade instruments, which Elizabeth mentioned, but these are 
very impractical, and they're well outside the price point we could expect a customer to pay. Now, in terms of our business model, from an operations management perspective, we're looking to make our workflow as lean as possible. That's got two components to it. First, we're trying to make the wristband as low cost as possible and ensure it's reusable. We're currently at about $27 per wristband when we make it, and that's in quantities of hundreds. As we expand and we look to quantities of thousands, we're expecting that to reduce. Also with our analysis, we're trying to automate as much as we possibly can of our analysis to reduce our labor costs and make sure that that's sustainable in the long run. And we're anticipating an entry price point of about $300. Thanks, Emma. Development of the Fresh Air wristband represents years of commitment from our team. We designed the original wristband back in 2016 and have introduced updated designs and features based on recommendations from our users. These include fashionable colors, base plates, and child-proof designs. We focus on establishing a high throughput analysis workflow and have collaborated with multiple international institutes and universities to demonstrate usability. As Jeremy mentioned, over 600 wristbands have been worn by people across the world. In the past few months, we published our work on the Springfield Studies, received the Rita Wilson C. Grant and Thai CD Summer Fellowship to, de to develop our business. If we receive the Rita Wilson Prize, we are planning to launch the market research project at the beginning of next year and finish it by the end of 2022. Again, you cannot change your genes, but you can change your environments by knowing the chemicals you're exposed to. The fresh air is the novel tool that can tell you what is in your air, Using this tool, we will have specific targets to reduce health disparities. With that, thank you all for listening. We will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, team. Judges? I'd be happy to start with a question. This is Jody Sindelar, and I find it really interesting, a very nice presentation. So thank you very much. I'm very impressed. But I have a question about how to understand, for example, if I wanted this, would it have actionable, could I be measuring, for example, if someone smokes in my house, or is it more like when you said malaria, someone spraying for malaria, is it something that I would know about and I could fix in my house, or is it something that is happening to me sort of environmentally? And one other question about that, it's just part of the same question, is if I wear it all day, it would be picking up, and I'm in different locations, would it be picking up toxins all over the place and I wouldn't know where the problem lies? I understand I could just wear it one place, and, but how does that, I'm just interested as a consumer, how does it work and how do I then take action based on your data? That is a great question. Actually, the sample is only aimed for the personal exposure. So everyone is different with uh, the perspective of exposure. Even if we are in the same room, we will be exposing to different chemicals because of products that we use. And we have developed a software that's called ChemCat that Jeremy can talk about it more and also Alex can more details that, will, can, that can do um, source categorization. The other thing I wanted to mention in relationship to that is because we can do source categorization as Elizabeth just mentioned, we can predict some sources and you're right, it is a time average. So you don't know when this happened. But one of our um, products that we're going to offer is a little, either we get funding from institutions when we're working with low income people or for high income people, we charge a higher price where we actually do follow-ups. So people will have their measured reports reported out. Then we'll see what are the lists of potential sources and potential chemicals of concern. We predict their toxicities. And then we'll come back to them and say, okay, well, these are the possible sources. Let's put samplers actually directly in those locations. Maybe it's your cooking plates. Um, maybe it's uh, by your window for outdoor exposures. Um, maybe it's just for a short time period. And then figure out where those sources are so that people can target those sources, take them out, uh, and have these personal one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions to try to figure out um, how to clean up their environments. Okay, good. Could you just give me one other personal source that would be in my house so I could shut my window, I could fix my stove, or what else? I'm just curious. 
because it has to be actionable in order for it to be useful to people. So I'm just like, is there another interior source that I could fix? So the another thing is uh, uh, pHs and phthalates. So those are chemicals that you really release from the painting, from the wall, and also all kinds of personal pro care products. So that uh, can, one thing that you can do is uh, we're in our sampler and we will tell you where are mainly the pHs will uh, come from and also what kind of products that will release most of the pHs or um, phthalates. Okay, good, thank you, that's helpful. That's one a great product. One more example, just because it's practical, is when we deployed it in China, we actually found huge exposures to naphthalene. And we found out, it's not validated yet, but it's probably from mothballs. So that's definitely mm -hmm. consumer products or specific things people are putting. People put a lot of different insecticides and stuff around their home. Right. They start it's, to get their breathing this. That would be one thing. And it detects smoking too in the air yes. or not? Nicotine. Okay. All right. Yes, Thank you. we have detect nicotine and um, marijuana. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks so much for your presentation and your um, just your overall application was uh, really well put together. Um, in your written application, you talked about early childhood exposures and um, you know detecting uh, environmental exposures early for for childhood wellness, um, but you didn't specifically address uh, lead, which is a, a very concerning um, early childhood exposure. Is that something it could t detect specifically before um, kind of the child wellness? blood uh, lead indicators um, for earlier detection. And then my second question, uh, less related, is around your mass spectrometer. So you mentioned that that's a barrier to entry for other companies wanting to, to do work in this area, but I'm assuming that that machine um, is owned by the university. So at what point would you outgrow working at the university um, and using that equipment and have to invest in that capital separately? So two unrelated questions, but if you could address those, I'd appreciate it. I will talk about the first question. Um, uh, so we cannot measure metals, but there are some partic particles that can be absorbed onto the sampler. So this could include metals that's absorbed onto the particles. And we have some methods that can measure those metals that's attached to the particles. And uh, we have collaborating uh, with a um, uh, researcher from uh, Canada. Uh, her, his name is Tom Harner. And uh, we have looked at the particle optic rays onto the uh, wristband samplers. And Jeremy can talk more about how we can handle the services used on the um, mass, mass spectrometer. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, so at first, of course, our mass spectrometer is owned by the university, and so that uh, limits what we can do from a business perspective. Um, but I think this will be great. We're continuing to build up academic partnerships, and in terms of the low-income communities, we're mostly working with institutions under grants, those kind of fundings. For, so for the short term, maybe five years, we'll still um, be doing it in terms of a research, but also applied directly. Um, and then as we expand, there's different service labs, so we can start outsourcing if we don't have the capital right away, where we can start um, and we can just do a cost analysis, whether it makes more sense to outsource it first and then to um, buy eventually our own mass spectrometers. Great, thank based you. On the oh, looks like we have time for one more judge's question. So Susan or Kave, if either of you have one. Um, I have a sort of follow-up to what Jody Simler asked. Would you say your primary customer are universities and sort of academic institutions doing research, or would you say it's just average, uh, you know, people, just customers? Would, who would you say is your um, number one customer of this product? Sure. So we've got three broad sets of customers uh, in the shortest term. We've got academic collaborations, which would include low-income communities and research partners. We're also looking at B2B partners. So we could go to insurance companies, we could go to large companies and other large-scale organizations just to get in high volume orders. And then the last group we would intend to approach would be individuals, so high-income individuals 
looking to measure their own exposures. Now, so far, we've focused on research, and those have been in low-income communities. That's who we're looking to in the short term, and especially as we start to conduct our market research, it'll be with them. Uh, we're also going to be looking at pricing differentiation between those groups. So if we do approach individual customers, it would be at a higher price point than we're currently looking at for our research collaborations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Team Fresh Air. Amazing job, amazing presentation, and best of luck. So we are ready for our third presentation. The Team COVID DX. Whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Uh, again, Team Enlighten and COVID DX, whenever you're ready. Thanks. For some reason, it's not letting me share a screen. Let's try this again. Um, it's not letting me share my browser. Abby, do you want to connect with Team COVID DX and, and help figure this out? And then we can jump to WIST and Sounds then we'll good. round up the presentation with COVID DX. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. We'll get this figured out. Okay, Team WIST, take it away. Hey. Um, okay. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, um, let's start. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Billy. I'm part of Source Development Hub and we work on WISP. So our pitch, we're creating a widely integrated social services platform, WISP, to reduce housing instability and improve associated health outcomes. So this is a map of New Haven's housing crisis, an eviction map, one of many housing crises nationally right now. So keep an eye out on these locations here. This is a recent map of COVID-19 hospitalizations in New Haven. It is remarkably well correlated with our eviction map. And over the past few decades, there's a growing body of research that ties together housing and health. And we're not just talking about data points on a map here. These are real places with real people impacted both by housing instability and health insecurities like COVID-19. Here's a few of those places throughout New Haven, from Bella Vista and Fairhaven to 66 Norton and Dwight. Housing instability is defined by needing to pay more than 30% of your income on rent. This affects one in three Americans, and even worse, one in two New Haveners. That's over 70,000 people right here. More recently, we just found out that over 30% of all Connecticut renters were unable to pay their April rent due to COVID. Consequences of this instability have bad outcomes for tenants. Historically, only about 20% of tenants undergoing eviction actually have legal representation. And that subsequently leads to over half a million homeless Americans. And that's just an estimate and can be as high as 3 million. The causes for housing instability can be broadly broken down to two categories, policy failures and socioeconomic inequities. On the policy side, instability is affected by a lack in public housing development deregulation of affordable existing housing, and inclusionary zoning failures for the private market. On the socioeconomic and health sides, intergenerational homelessness, the opioid crisis and substance abuse, as well as racial biases, all contribute to instability. 
And that's a lot of impact, both for individuals and institutions. Families, children, and persons with disabilities are among the most affected primary stakeholders. There's also effects on institutional stakeholders and the community. Housing instability greatly affects families, especially single mothers. It puts individuals at risk of acute infectious diseases as evidenced by COVID and chronic diseases like HIV AIDS. Instability also has effects on the cognitive and developmental growth of children. It adversely affects the elderly and persons with disabilities by also reducing access to care. And it also affects communities and institutions. It causes shelters here over $7,000 to shelter family in New Haven. Evictions cost landlords about four to six months of lost rent. Instability increases Medicaid expenditures by over 12%. And this all trickles down to the taxpayer. Leaving a person homeless costs the country as much as $30,000 to $50,000 a year. Now, what if we could intervene? What if we could come up with a scalable solution to housing instability? Some existing platforms that address housing fall into two broad categories healthcare referrals or social determinants of health platforms like NowPow and more real estate focused platforms, PropTech, like Zillow. However, SDOH platforms do not provide direct housing access, only referrals, while PropTech platforms do not provide ongoing case management. So there's currently a gap to design a housing-based platform that also offers ongoing care. There are urgent needs right here in our backyard. These are direct pages from the City of New Haven's Affordable Housing Task Force that specifically highlights two acute housing needs, funding a case manager program to help residents navigate affordable housing and streamlining a system to access affordable housing. There are additional needs to create training programs to keep families housed. And out of this, we've identified three key customer segments that are most affected, tenants, consumers of affordable housing, landlords who are suppliers of affordable housing, and finally, housing case managers who facilitate these rental transactions and provide follow-up care. And so for each of these customer segments, can we now use technology to provide better services to find housing and lower risk of losing it? This is the widely integrated social services platform, WISP, a holistic system that takes three key innovations, education, marketplace, and case management to address housing instability with tenants, landlords, and case managers. The objectives of these innovations is teaching to rent, finding a home, and retaining housing, respectively. The key need is finding a home. That is our MVP, the affordable housing marketplace. It's a simple concept, connecting tenants to affordable housing. However, innovation is necessary because unlike Zillow or Craigslist, many tenants needing affordable housing are limited not just by price, but also by bad credit, racial bias, criminal history, and also landlords who just don't accept their housing subsidies. We innovate by developing an inventory for tenants to search for affordable housing and for landlords to advertise in it, but also an ability to match tenants with landlords and the ability for, tenant, uh, for landlords to refer tenants to other landlords. This gives agency to tenants, it removes selection bias on the landlord side, and also increases the market by allowing landlords to provide access to other landlords. And this is it in play. On the left-hand side of our marketplace, tenants and case managers can search for affordable housing using search filters that include subsidies such as Section 8. They can also filter for opportunity metrics such as access to healthcare or transit. Finally, they can follow up with a contact option. And on the right-hand side, Landlords can accept any income request and continue the conversation, or they can refer the request to another landlord. These actions offer direct connections between tenants and landlords and greatly decreases the difficulties of searching for affordable housing. And while the marketplace is our MVP, we've already developed the ecosystem around it to make it truly unique and innovative. We've added tools for learning to make tenants more knowledgeable and attractive. We've added automated surveying for health and health housing to connect tenants with case managers for continued care. Here's an example of an educational survey we've developed. This is a web-based prototype that we've developed for veterans to help them manage finances or rent. And you can try it out online, gift.wisp.services. And we've already developed a case management system for follow-up care. This is an app interface for case managers. If clients have issues, providers can send them automated text reminders or surveys and get real-time feedback. Now, we believe that our marketplace ecosystem provides great value. Let's revisit our impact to stakeholders again. Now, 
If housing instability leads to health disparities, then housing stability should improve health outcomes and well-being. That is the idea behind Housing First, a clinical framework that is now implemented worldwide. With WISP, we can provide direct access to housing and improve access to care. This improves opportunity for everyone. Institutions also benefit. Providers can scale up their work, landlords can fill up vacancies, and they could use our case management system to call in for case uh, to mediate any issues. Medical no-shows decrease because of our automated reminders, and this all filters down to decreased service utilization at the municipal level. Looking forward, we're already developing the marketplace in Fairview County. We're hoping to be able to use the funding here to be able to scale the R&D and server costs to bring the marketplace to New Haven. We could do so by late summer using our current infrastructure. We also hope to use the funding to develop partnerships and grow the market to integrate case management and begin clinical impact measurement. We want to layer in educational tools, which we already developed for further intervention. We're confident in our ability to bring WIS to market. We're a diverse team with engineering, research, and advocacy backgrounds. I'm currently at the School of Management. Our research lead, Yasmin, is an assistant professor at YSPH. Our engineers, Nelson and Allen, have experiences with machine learning and data viz. We also have advocates, Adam Rawlings, who's done a lot of work locally with neighborhood housing services, and Latea Wright, our attorney, who's done some human rights work. Finally, we also have several clinicians to be able to better understand the health outcomes. Lisa Wong, a public health pharmacist, as well as our mentors, Jack Sai and Annie Harper at the School of Medicine. Finally, well, I'd like to thank our wonderful partners, local, regional, and national, from Christian Community Action to Regional Plan Association to the Urban Institute. Thanks for joining us today for this discussion, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have now. Hi, this is Susan Nappy. Um, first and foremost, I wanna applaud you for your efforts on taking on something very messy, knowing that uh, housing, um, stable, affordable housing is at the cornerstone of public health efforts and is probably one of the best primary prevention strategies. Um, also working with community partners like CCA, which have been really in the thick of it for many generations in New Haven. I'm really curious, um, though because obviously and this is kind of you know something that you're dealing with i'm sure you know in new haven the biggest issue is really availability of that affordable housing so even though you might be doing a great match matchmaking with what is out there there is not enough so i'm wondering if you i'm curious about and i'm sure you've thought about this sort of the the, the space you can take up around providing a data feedback loop to the partners to illustrate the need and kind of the roadblocks in sort of um, making successful matches? Right, that's a great question, Susan. Um, and that's the question we've thought a lot about. So the idea is, right, it's always a supply and demand issue. Um, if there is no supply, how can actually technology, you know, increase supply? It actually can't. Um, so this is where we work with a lot of our partners. We work with a lot of multilaterals. So just to give an example beyond our partners right here, I'm going to switch down. We're part of the, um, the Fairfield County Housing Alliance. And this is over 60 um, multilateral um, organizations that work, you know, ranging in the banking industry to, you know, the city of Stanford, you know, to the Department of Housing um, and, and a lot of, you know, service direct care providers as well. So the idea is that using a marketplace system like this, which hasn't been developed, we're going to collect an existing inventory of what's available, what's out there. And then that would inform a gap analysis of what actually needs to be done. And anecdotally and qualitatively, we always talk about the need for more affordable housing, but no one's actually done a real hard quantitative look at what's out there, what's needed, and the projections that are needed. So what we're doing with the marketplace is we're actually gathering the insight to be able to do that. Ultimately, this is really a multi-sector you know, issue. This is a community planning issue. This is an economic development issue, but we hope to use the data from our marketplace to directly inform those insights for better policy. However, the marketplace itself provides direct benefits to both tenants and providers looking for immediate housing. So this is Jody Sindelar. Billy, thank you very much. This is a really big and important project. And Mike, it looks like it takes a lot of uh, connections, efforts. You have to know the community and have all these uh, people that you work with. So I'm, I'm wondering what you're thinking about in terms of 
uh, scaling? Can you, you're going to go to New Haven, but how much of it is just, well, not just, but takes a lot of time to understand what's going on and it's difficult to move to another town or how much of it is you're useful and they have your software and it wouldn't be that hard to move to another town or provide more people with help. Right, right. So when we first started this out, the reason why we built three elements, Jody, of this together, um, the educational tools, the case management, and also the marketplace, is because we saw distinct needs that could be addressed. And the, the tricky problem of housing is you can't solve a single one and expect to have lasting impact, right? Um, you actually have to solve it all holistically, and you really need longitudinal care um, for follow-up. Um, so when speaking directly to a case management system, we already piloted. So last year we ran a pilot um, on the left-hand side here with CCA, and we sent them automated reminders to their clients and whatnot, and um, you know they liked it. Um, it was it's something that is small, scalable, and can work with individual providers. When we're talking about a marketplace system like this, it requires a lot more multilateral collaborations, and this is why we were you know we're really privileged to be able to work with the entire alliance in Fairview County. So we're working now, you know, with places like Regional Plan Association, which have a lot of these data sets. And we're beginning to work with urban institutes, which also has a lot of different data, data sets, as well as places like the uh, Connecticut Finance Housing Authority. Um, so being able to leverage all these partners allows us to have a robust network that we can then begin to scale these programs in. And of course, it's really important because part of this Fairview um, County Alliance is that we work directly with municipalities. So the city of Stanford has been really helpful. And so when we bring that knowledge and that know-how here to New Haven, we've already laid the groundwork to have those network connections. You know, so I'm part of also uh, Velma George's uh, Landlord Engagement Task Force here in New Haven. The idea is that we work directly with those providers and scale the marketplace to them in the beginning. So we already built the groundwork. The next steps are really just taking it to the next level, making sure that you know this is something that they foresee as part of their programs moving forward. So just a quick follow-up. So do you imagine you're going to help a lot of cities in New Haven County and Fairfield County or all of Connecticut or all of the United States or sort of what is your vision? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I think for all practical reasons, Fairfield County is where we're being funded currently and where we'll start. New Haven has a really great need for this. And we actually start out a lot of the research in New Haven itself. Um, so about two years ago, Jack Sai and I, we worked with YSPH and Debbie Humphreys, her practicum, and we actually surveyed Bella Vista um, to, to look at some, some needs there. Uh, and it was a lot, very qualitative. And then we took those and we had qualitative interviews with local providers. And we found there's a huge gap and a huge need for this in New Haven. It was just that it, it was a difficult climate to work in. And there were a lot of different competing ideas. Um, so Fairview County allowed us to really scale quickly and develop quickly. And we hope to bring that back here to New Haven because I think there's a huge urgent need for it, especially now. Okay, thank you. Nicole Cave, we have time for one more question. Um, so thank you again, Billy. You're, you're tackling one of the, probably the most important uh, social determinants of health uh, with all sorts of potential uh, outcomes. So I'm curious, um, what are your priorities in terms of what does success look like? Yeah, what, that's a great what point. the main um, outcome that you would want to see um, improve as a result of your venture? Right. So let's check out direct impact measurement. So we can break down impact measurement into three categories, sustainability, usage and growth, but really, you know, what we're interested in is health outcomes, right? So quickly talking about the first two, right? We measure the number of tenants or landlords or case managers and road in our system. We could do things like customer relationship management and look at customer value to look at the sustainability of this. But in terms of clinical outcomes, we could look at things like duration of housing, number of housing crises averted. We will use a VS to that vulnerability index. We could use a life satisfaction survey as well as self-reported health outcomes. And of course, we may work with providers to provide more objective assessments. We'll also work with GFC scale for self-efficacy. And further down the line, it might be beneficial for us to look at cost reduction estimates directly from providers and government. And here's an idea that Yasmin really came up with, tying housing to food insecurity. So looking at a metabolic panel pre and post you know, housing intervention. Um, and that, that's further down the line. And of course, maybe another happiness, next, happiness metric. We have an inside joke that we're going to measure frequency of dancing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Billy. You've been working on this for several years and, and your progress is really amazing to watch. 
Okay, so we are ready for Team Kova DX. Great. Okay, it's working. Awesome. So, Yao, um, ready whenever you are. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Yao. And I'm Tim. And together we are Cover the X. So, as Cover the X, we are bridging the health disparity faced by people with sickle cell disease. So, sickle cell is a, a group of genetic disorders which cause the red blood cells to become abnormally shaped and break down. So the red blood cell, which you see pictured on the left, under normal circumstances is biconcave and, and round. Um, but in sickle cell, you have a mutation in the globin gene, which causes the, sickles, the red blood cells to become sickle-shaped. And when they become sickle-shaped, they clog together and block the blood vessels and cause severe complications like stroke and severe pain. This also reduces the lifespan of the red blood cells from about 120 days to about 10 days. I'm a career of the sickle cell trait myself, and as a physician who has cared for patients with sickle cell, I'm very well acquainted with the disease. So over here, we have a young man known as Lance Jones, and he has lived with sickle cell all his life. He's in graduate school, and he's currently studying psychology, but because of sickle cell, he has experienced chronic pain his entire life. In fact, he's been in and out of the hospital many times that he can remember. And it's not just Lance that sickle cell impacts. It impacts so many people. Indeed, you have one out of every 365 African-American births being sickle cell. And it's a known fact that in America right now, the life expectancy of African-Americans is less than those of their counterparts. So if you juxtapose this with the fact that sickle cell disease reduced the lifespan to about 42 to 48 years, you realize that sickle cell disease actually worsens an already existing problem. And again, it's a known fact that by the age of 45, those with sickle cell would have spent close to a million dollars on treatment. And this is mainly because the current diagnostic tools are very expensive and require skilled personnel. So currently to diagnose it, an initial screening test, none of the solubility test is done. And basically what this test does is that it determines whether the patient has a sickle cell gene or not. But then this doesn't tell the exact type of sickle cell. And it's important to know this because this determines the prognosis of the patient. So to determine the prognosis, a confirmatory test is done. And this can be HB electrophoresis, which is the gold standard, or HPLC. But this required a skilled personnel to apply an electric current and monitor how well the cells move. And it ends up increasing the cost. And so this is why we built Cover DX to provide a faster and more affordable medical device for not just diagnosing sickle cell, but actually to also monitor those with the disease. And we are building our device on published and patented research. So I hand over to Tim to explain how the device works. Thanks, Yao. So for how our device works, a medical personnel collects a sample of blood from the patient and then puts it into one of our patented cartridges. That cartridge is then inserted into our device to be imaged and for each of the red blood cells, you get a 3D image of the cell. Those 3D images are then taken and passed through our deep learning model, which performs the classification to determine both whether or not the person has sickle cell disease, as well as the health of the red blood cells if they do have sickle cell. The results are then displayed on the screen of the device and to be seen by the doctor, and it would also be sent to a secure server so they can be viewed on a healthcare platform by both the doctor and the patient at their leisure. I'll pass it back over to Yao to talk about our unique value proposition. Thank you, Tim. So currently, HP electrophoresis, which is the, the gold standard, can take up to two days. And it's mainly because the test has to be done by a skilled personnel and run in batches. So Cover DX is breaking this down to less than a minute. And again, HP electrophoresis can cost up to $63. And we are bringing it down to less than $2. Now, $63 may not seem a lot to a lot of you. But if you consider the fact that majority of sickle cell patients are actually on Medicaid, and less than 70% of providers want to accept people on Medicaid, you realize that bringing down the cost will go down a long way. Um, again, our tool does not require staining and skilled personnel, and so it will be easier to use. But this is not just where we beat the competition. We are currently also building a unique red cell membrane index, which will be able to tell 
not just the, the genotype of the sickle cell patient, but also how well the patient is doing, the probability of the patient having a crisis, and also the efficacy of therapy. And so this will have a direct impact of, on clinical decision making, because currently sickle cell disease patients experience a longer wait time by healthcare providers because they are seen to be drug seekers and their complaints are ignored. So having an objective way of knowing how well they are doing will help them have access to more clinical care. Currently, we plan to sell to clinical facilities and labs, especially in lower resource settings. We also plan to partner with a lot of nonprofits. And the main source of revenue will be the sale of the affordable cartridges, which Tim spoke about. Um, in America, we have 50% of sickle cell patients visiting the hospital at least five times a year. And so the plan is that with each visit, they are gonna come in with our tests, which will tell how well they are doing. And so this will provide constant revenues. And so the projected cost for the cartridge is about less than $2. And then in terms of the device, we're going to sell it around $600 to the clinical facilities. But we are also going to generate revenue from the sale of the device. And then we will outsource our manufacturing. We've done extensive literature review on the existing disparity. And we've also spoken with um, physicians and also clinical facilities in the area who are interested in partnering with us. We've also designed a unique questionnaire to administer to sickle cell patients on, Unfortunately, because of the current pa pandemic, we've not been able to administer it, but the plan is to administer it once all of the subsides. In terms of the potential market in America, you have about 100,000 sickle cell patients and globally the market is about $5.3 billion. But sickle cell is actually not the only tool our imaging technology can be applied to. In the future, we are actually gonna apply it to malaria and blood cancers and a whole lot of other diseases. And so, Clearly, the economic potential of our project is, is, is very, very big. So I'll hand over back to Tim to talk some more about our team. Thanks, Yao. So though we are in the prototyping stage right now, Yao and I absolutely believe that we're the team for the job. We have the technical background needed with me being a computer science PhD student here at Yale with a lot of experience in machine learning and deep learning, and with Yao being an MD as well as a biomedical engineer. And we also have the entrepreneurship skills required. Yao and I have been friends for over a year, have been working together that whole time. And this is actually our second venture together. So we really do know how to, how to work together and to use our technical skills to get things done. We have a great set of advisors that have been supporting us and helping us along the way from both the scientific as well as the business side of things. They have just been an immense encouragement, giving us great direction. And we just would not be able to do it without them. As for our milestones, we built our first prototype a few months back. We were then accepted into the ABCT Accelerator, a biotech accelerator here in Connecticut. We received $30,000 from the Connecticut Innovation Fund, which we've been using to get the microscope for our device. We plan to finish the device by the summer of 2020, and then we'll use it to collect data to train our deep learning models. And then once those have been trained and we've been able to prove that our device works just as expected, then we'll go and raise the seed round funding, which we'll use to actually build the product and then go to market. As for our IP, um, we are just about to sign an exclusive patent for the microscope system that we'll be using, this 3D quantitative phase imaging system. And we're also collecting IP from a bunch of areas as well, including the proprietary cartridge, which uses microfluidics to separate the blood into its various components as well as the red blood cell QPI image data that we'll be collecting once we've built our device, the AI algorithms that we're developing to process that data, and the microscope improvements as we build on top of the patent. As for how we plan to use the Wilson Prize, we think that about 5,000 of the dollars will go towards building the blood uh, cartridge system. So this requires design and engineering, and a good amount of work to make, it, to make it so that it separates the blood into like individual blood cells. We also have 3,000 going towards data collection once the cartridge and the whole system has been built to train the deep learning models and $2,000 going towards customer engagement and user experience design, making sure that we're designing this just so that the customers have exactly what they want. In summary, COVID-DX is bridging the health disparity faced by people with sickle cell disease by making the diagnosis and monitoring of sickle cell faster, cheaper, and easier to use. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Team COVID-DX. Amazing job. Judges, take it away. Yeah, that's a great question, Jody. Do you want to take that one, Yao? Sure. So currently, we we have the, I would say we have the exclusive patent. So the next thing is basically to reassemble the device, which with the support of our mentors, we can finish by the end of the summer. And then the next step would involve basically collecting data with the device to be able to build our algorithm. So we think by the end of the year, we would have our prototype ready. And then the next step basically will be to fundraise and improve what we have to build a commercial version. So all in all, we're hoping that in three years, we could get to market. Okay, thank you. And I forgot to say that was a fabulous presentation of a really important and interesting project. So I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, oh, go ahead, Kabe. Oh, Susan. Um, okay, uh, this is Susan Nappy, and first um, and foremost, this really clarified a lot of the questions I had from your application, and I was really inspired by uh, the direct impact and application this could have to address racial inequities, um, and also really inform healthcare protocols. Um, I think, you know, I was thinking a lot about diabetes and how making tracking accessible really changed the lives of so many. Um, I really wanted to just, I'm curious a little bit more about your marketing to healthcare, uh, your healthcare partners and really that component of it, because for me, when I look at this, I think, you know, that's probably your direct, where you're going to be doing your direct marketing and really sort of that fierce competition in that space for, um, for that kind of marketing and just, just your thoughts on that. Thank you, Susan. So currently, Sickle cell diagnosis with the HB electrophoresis is already on the, a lot of the health ins insurance, including the Medicaid. But the problem is that the current tests are more expensive. And so we think by competing on price, we will be able to convince a whole lot of them to be able to adopt our tool. Yeah, we'll both be doing kind of what they can do for the a cheaper price and also offering the monitoring services, which the current options don't even have whatsoever. Thank you again for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you mentioned you had a couple of focus groups with clinicians and some health facilities. I'm curious what you learned from that conversation. Thank you, yeah. Kevin. So one thing we learned is that actually sickle cell uh, disease is considered as an orphan disease in the US. And that's also very important and it's informed my perspective because I actually practice as a clinician in Africa. And in Africa, sickle cell is actually not an orphan disease because almost everyone has it, like it's very, very common. And so I realized that it was treated as an orphan disease in the US and that actually affects the funding and also how it's tackled. But at the same time, we also realized that most of the patients who had sickle cell actually were on the Medicaid and most of the physicians were hesitant to accept the Medicaid. And also on top of that, majority of the patients were seen as just because most of them end up coming in with a crisis and they are in severe pain. And because they are in severe pain, most of the physicians end up dismissing their symptoms because they come to the, the clinic often. And so they are seen as people who just want to sort of seek drugs or pain relief. And so, or to abuse the, basically the opiates. And so by provide, we realized that there was, because currently they basically assess the level of pain using a subjective pain scale. And so by having an actual objective biological tool, which predicts and tells how well the patients are doing, you'll be able to basically um, tell exactly objectively how well the patients are doing without dismissing their claims. Thank you. Uh, 
Hi, thanks again for your presentation. Um, in your written application, I believe you also spoke about um, distribution and going to market in Africa. I think you referenced Ghana specifically. Mm -hmm. um, in your presentation today, you really focused on the US market. Mm -hmm. So could you explain how that might fit into your, your timeline and your plan for going to market um, in, other, uh, in other countries? Thanks, Nicole. I could take that one. So one of the reasons that we're interested in going globally is because there's so many people across the world, both across the continent of Africa as well as in, in India that have, that have sickle cell. And the regulation process in some of these other countries is a little bit faster than it is here in America. So as soon as we have the prototype up and working and, and you know, everything working as expected, we're going to be starting the, the regulation process with FDA here as well as in other countries that have a little bit faster process. So then once those get through, we'll, we'll be able to start selling our device and getting some cash flow, cash flow there while we're waiting for the, the regulation process to finish up here in America. And then as soon as it's done in here in America, then we'll launch here as well. So we're kind of going for, for both, um, knowing that we can get into some other countries just a little bit faster than we can here in America. Okay, very interesting. And last question, you mentioned um, that you've been working together and this is your second venture. Uh, could you tell us just a little bit about your first venture? Sure. Uh, do you want to take that? Yeah, or should I? I think you should take it. Okay. So our first venture was a dating app that we were doing together. Um, we were launching it in sub-Saharan Africa and it was going pretty well and, and we were enjoying it, but we did realize that there was an opportunity to have a, a more meaningful impact using our skills and uh, in technical backgrounds and stuff. So that's kind of when we decided to, to switch to COVIDX. Okay. Thanks so much. Judges, any final questions for COVIDX? Nope. Okay. So now the judges and I will go into a private Zoom room. I planned about 30 minutes, but it might be less. It definitely won't be more. So hang out here if you're tuning in live. 93 of you are, which is really cool. I'm excited about that number. Uh, hang out here. Abby is going to launch the audience choice poll. So the audience choice poll is an opportunity for all of our attendees who are tuning in live to vote for their favorite team. You heard from four amazing teams. I don't know how you're going to make a decision. Abby will launch that for our attendees. And then we will be back uh, definitely before 1115. Yes, judges, I will send you in chat a private link to a private Zoom room, and it is also in your email. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, stay tuned. We'll be back. Hi, finalists. You did a wonderful job, so thank you very much. Audience, uh, get ready. I am going to launch the audience choice poll. There's 95 of you um, in the room, so everybody Please vote now for your favorite pitch or project. All right. And with that, we are going to close the polls in just a second. Everybody, please make sure you've submitted your vote. All right, and we'll be sharing the results of the audience choice poll when Fatima and the judges get back and also announcing the grand prize winner. So audience, you can sit back and relax for about 20 minutes. Um, finalists, you can mute yourselves and uh, leave your videos on or turn your videos off. I may try to engage you in some witty banter, we'll see. <laughs> 